Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're all very welcome to the Bankers tonight. Uh, tonight, we are treated to uh, Mr. Jeff Lillis, otherwise known as Jeff Shorts. Uh, anyone who hasn't checked out his blog, I recommend you do so. It's uh, very informative and uh, tells of his tales of street preachers, which he's going to do for us tonight. So, Jeff, would you like to come up? You'll be relieved to know I decided not to wear shorts. Hi everyone, welcome. How many people are here for the first time? And how many people are regulars? And how many people don't put their hands up? <laughs> it's my second time myself and I'm a little bit worried that I might have misjudged the crowd. I'm standing on a raised platform. I'm shouting into a microphone. I'm reading from sacred texts. If this is the sort of thing you normally approve of, you're not going to like the rest of this talk. <laughs> I'll be talking without interruption. I'll be telling you of what I disapprove. I'll be quoting scripture, and I'll be telling you of meetings you should attend. It's only because I don't want to pay for photocopying that you're not getting any flyers. <laughs> Some of you may be wondering who I am. What will probably follow is my second most frequently asked question. What are you doing here? I, I talk to street preachers. I read books they recommend, I review them on my blog, and I talk about the experience. I've been on three Christian debate shows, one creationist podcast, and I've re recently been asked to write a guest column for a Christian magazine. That's quite a bit of Christian contact for an atheist, and I met quite a few smart, interesting Christians along the way. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. We're here to talk about the fringe element. We're here to talk about the street preachers. First of all, how am I different from a street preacher? Well, there's a roof over our heads, but that's not a comfortable enough divide for me. <laughs> Is it because I'm a shining example of rationality? Well, maybe we should examine that claim. I think Scooter produced the finest music to come from the country that gave us Beethoven, Bach, and Brahms. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy the acting skills of Jason Statham. I enjoyed Crank One. I watched Crank 2. <laughs> I used to be a climate change denier. I got better. I wake up every morning and I think that this is a good haircut. <laughs> Worst of all, I talk to street preachers. Now there's a part of me that's willing to accept I can't claim unbridled rationality for every single one of these beliefs. So what separates me from people who believe the world is 7,000 years old or who, preach, or who preach a coming apocalypse of all gay people. Well, I'm willing to live with non-scooter fans. Some of my best friends don't even possess a single album, and while I'm hurt that they keep on returning my Christmas presents, we get along in relative peace. I even married a Mundy and, Funs, uh, and Sons fan. How different would it be if I felt that all non-scooter fans were immoral, deluded, and deserving of eternal torment? If I was well financed and determined to spread my scooter views, I would very rapidly become a menace to society. So you're probably wondering what it's like to talk to a street preacher because I'm fairly confident I'm the only person who does it. Often when I talk to them, I'm reminded of the words of that famous Austrian philosopher, Arnold Schwarzenegger, from his classic work, The Terminator 2. <laughs> my CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer but Skynet presets the switch to read only when they send us out on our own. I don't do accents. There's a particularly unpleasant waterborne parasite called the tongue-eating louse. The name holds many clues. Now you'll be relieved to know that they can't affect humans in any way, but fish are not quite so lucky. What this louse will do is it will swim in through the gill slits of a fish, find its way into their mouth, and then bite into the tongue, cutting off the blood supply. Once done, the, t the tongue will wither and die. But it gets worse, because the louse will then stay in place, attached onto the stump, and it will function like a rudimentary prosthetic. The fish will waggle the, st with the stump, the louse will move around, and that is how it gets its food. Now, it obviously does not, does not have its host's best interest at heart. What I've learned from these oddball adventures of mine is that ideas and, fr and frameworks can act in much the same way. Once they've entered into the mind, they'll seek out the source of rationality and attempt to strangle it of nourishment, gradually replacing our ability to reason with a hostile and untrustworthy pretender. Hare Krishna street preachers, for example, 
typically believe that Maya has corrupted this material world, that this material environment is illusory, that input to our senses cannot be trusted, and the only path to true knowledge is through meditation and the works of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakatevita Swami Prabhupada. <laughs> that was my best attempt at pronunciation, and I still don't do accents. This allows them to believe, for example, that the moon is larger than the sun, made of fire, enclosed in ice. That is the reason we have vegetation on every planet in the solar system, and that it's located further from the Earth than the sun. It also allows them to believe their founders' promulgation that women's brains weigh half that of men's. Let's move on to young Earth creationists. Common amongst them is the belief that the Almighty has given us two revelations. The first is the Bible, which is inerrant, infallible, was written in English by a man by the name of King James, and is perfectly interpreted by Ken Ham. <laughs> the second is the earth, which has been corrupted by Satan. In one fell swoop, they can explain away anything you throw at them. If you read my blog, you see I have something of a soft spot for my fellow Irishman, John Lennox, the last creationist to debate Dawkins before he saw the sense of not doing that anymore. His books are now selling for a quid on Amazon, John Lennox that is, not Dawkins, <laughs> and I like to feel that my thorough reviews have had something to do with that. That's a good measure of my ego. I noticed that he quoted an anti-evolution book by Professor Siegfried Scherer, entitled Evolution, ein kritisches Lehrbuch. As luck would have it, I speak a little German, so I checked him out. He claims the Earth is seven and a half thousand years old, a significant error. And when asked why there is so much coal present, he came up with a work of genius. Giant floating trees with hollow roots, forming huge forests, floating all over a completely flooded planet. Waves and whirlpools helpfully guiding them all down to our current coal beds in specific locations around the world. They'll tell you these stories and more fanciful tales of dinosaurs dying due to spontaneous nasal combustion. Feel free to ask about that in the Q&A. <laughs> and also, uh, there'll be all, all sorts of other pseudoscientific nonsense. But ultimately, they view knowledge gained from interactions with the world around them, a poor and distant second to sacred text. Now, what of Islam? Those of us who've read a translation of the Quran will know there are many references to Allah hardening the hearts of unbelievers, so we cannot accept the truth of his final prophet. While this may seem a might unfair, it does give some street preachers excellent reason to dismiss any reasoning offered against their claims. Now, the best way to describe these frameworks that I've heard is intellectual black holes. Stephen Law discusses them in depth in Believing Bullshit, an excellent book that, among many other things, changed my mind on the usefulness of philosophy. Once you fully accept a framework like this, the pull of parasitic thought processes becomes too strong to resist, and the atrophied rope of your rationality will be insufficient to haul you out. But is there hope? I don't think we can pull them out from the outside. I think we have to follow them in. Take the Moonies. Outside the GPO, you'll find what appears to be a perfectly nice woman distributing flyers saying Jesus failed in his cosmic mission. But have no fear. The Reverend Sun Myung Moon has been appointed by God to fix his failings and has come to Earth to form the perfect family. Moon is her Messiah, his words divine. Now, if we wrap ourselves in this blanket of irrationality, we can go through Reverend Moon's speeches and see if we can introduce some cognitive dissonance in her worldview. The Mooney Messiah foretells a purge of all gay people. From what I can tell from his writing, this will happen on January 13th next year. He described gays as dirty, dung-eating dogs. She says she has gay friends, but then again, don't all bigots. She says she does not think they are dirty, dung-eating dogs, nor should they be burned. I've had this chat with her on several occasions, and every time I'm strongly reminded of Leonardo DiCaprio in Inception, staring at a spinning top, wondering why it won't fall over, and knowing something is not quite right in his world. Unfortunately, I can't do this anymore. 
It seems that I have a very aggressive looking spirit animal, so she's not willing to speak to me. <laughs> Again, feel free to ask about that in the Q&A. Now, can we do anything with young Earth creationists? I, for one, think the universe is real. I think we can learn things about it. And the best tools for this particular task are the tools of science. In addition to highlighting inconsistencies and, and contradictions in someone's worldview, you can also see if their worldview contains any useful features that will aid in your cause. In this case, you just can't go wrong with the Bible. Your best bet is to make some smart Christian friends. The vast, overwhelming majority of Christians don't go in for intelligent design, young earth creationism, miracle healings, and all the other twaddle. If that interaction doesn't grab you, and you have two or three euro to spare, Genesis for Normal People is a rather good book. If you quote data on radioactive decay to a young earth creationist, the shutters will close. If you quote a decent argument from Genesis, it will get them thinking. Dan Barker, former Fundy Christian, now co-president of the Freedom From Belief Foundation, atheist, and on some levels probably still a Fundy, said that it was always the arguments from the Bible that he found most unnerving in his creationist days. Does anyone know Desi? You'd probably see him on O'Connell Street. He's got a microphone headset, stands about three steps high. I'm seeing one or two, not, I've got, got quite a few nuts there. Maybe a book might be too much for you, but let me try a short story, which you will, you will remember. It's an analogy that actually made Desi read with enthusiasm The Greatest Show on Earth by Dawkins. He's still a creationist. What I said was, after Jesus died, his disciples did not go and immediately spread Christianity. They waited, in the upstairs room to be precise, until the Holy Spirit came down to them and bestowed gifts, bestowed gifts upon them. And once this happened, they walked out and they started talking to the masses, and people were astounded because everyone could understand them in their own language. Now, what I took from this is they waited until they could communicate with people, understand what they were saying and what to say to them. And what I said to Desi was that what he learned about evolution from Answers in Genesis and other websites was not how we view the world, and that he would be a better evangelist for Christianity if he read a book written by someone who knew about evolution. But as I said, he's still a creationist. So is there any practical application to my knowledge? or have I squandered your evening in addition to several of my own. I've been referred to as an evangelist, and having heard the term and understand what it means to someone who spreads the good news, I have no immediate objection to it. I do have a message to spread, and I hope some of you agree that it's worth spreading and spreading well. There are a few levels I like to shoot for in, or in order of difficulty. One is convincing people that atheists can be nice and normal people. Secondly, uh, there's nothing on earth wrong with being an atheist. Third, we as atheists can have a sensible conversation about what we believe and why. Fourth, science is the best way of learning how the universe, how the universe works now, how it worked in the past, and how it will work in the future. Five, intelligent designers, young earth creationists, Harry C Krishna cosmologists, and similar, are not using the scientific method. Six, you can be an intellectually fulfilled atheist with good grounds for objective morality. You probably notice that atheism itself isn't on that list. You, you also might have noticed that it's something religious folk could sign up to, though some may not. Maybe your list is different. It could also have more elements or fewer. Either way, what can we learn from street preachers? It could be that their existence can serve only as a cautionary tale to us on how not to do this. For that reason, I give you my commandments. One, I talk, I don't preach. It's easy to get up on a podium and shout a set speech, oh dear, <laughs> or, or get 20 friends on Twitter to gang up on a victim, or jump straight to the Bronze Age myths conversation ender. It's trickier to, uh, to have a conversation, but you'll give a better impression of atheists if you do. Two, be polite. Believe me, no one sees this coming. It will confuse and astound people. <laughs> Three, know what you know. More importantly, know what you don't. Street preachers can be embarrassingly poor on evolution. It doesn't improve their standing. I know very little about the Old Testament. Therefore, I don't talk about it much. Four, learn what the other person believes. Not what you might think they believe, or nor what you've read in the net, but what they actually believe. They will take you much more seriously. Five, 
finally, don't monopolize the conversation. And seeing as I've been doing that for most of the night so far, I'm going to turn it over to questions and answers. <laughs>